All right, so this section is going to be, I labeled it 2.1, but it's really little pieces of all of chapter two that we need to cover. So we are going to model with quadratics and just kind of remembering how to solve a little bit on the quadratics and um, applying them to some business applications. All right, so I put a little um, information here to remember standard form of a quadratic is just when it's in the AX squared plus BX plus C form, right? It's in that um, descending degree of the term order, right? So it starts with usually an X squared and goes down for a quadratic. Um, the vertex form, um, you do a lot of that kind of stuff in your algebra class, right? Where you write it in vertex form, you could get your vertex. We like to find our vertex because it is typically in our business world, we have um, a, you know, a parabola shape that's upside down or U shape upside down. And that top is our goal price, our goal demand, our goal, whatever we're looking at. So we need to be able to know how to find that. So that's our vertex. So if it's in this form, we can get the opposite of what's here for this. So they, they call it H here, negative here, right? So if it's a negative two, you use a two. If it's a positive two, you use a negative two. You switch the sign and then the same sign as this one. And that's your vertex. Okay, axis of symmetry is the line down the middle. Um, for business, you know, it's pretty much like when we cut it in half, it's like the price is too low and the price is too high kind of, kind of idea, right? Um, for demand. And then minimum um, and max value is whether it curves up. You got that min, right? Maybe I'll put a little drawing here with the min. Um, this would be a max, because it's the highest. And this would be the min. And they're all at that vertex. Okay. And the last thing that I put on here is just the formula um, for getting the vertex if it's in standard form. So if it's in this form, I can't just see it. And I don't want to complete the square to see it because completing the square is not always pretty. So what we could do is just use this formula to find the X, put that value back into your function to find your Y. All right, so let's start with remembering how to solve some of our quadratics. Remember the solution is where it crosses the X or where the zeros are or the intercepts. Like we have all those words that all mean the same thing. But if we look at this first problem here on problem one, there's no X term like there is here, here. Um, so we're gonna use just square roots to solve this one because there's no X, it's only an X squared. So we're gonna add this six over just like solving for X squared so that I have X squared equals 25 and then I'll square root to find the answer. But what you have to remember is there's two solutions. X squared has possibly two. You could have none or one, but most of the time you have two solutions. So when I square root it, that undoes that X squared, I have to remember to do the plus and minus there. Right, because if I square root the x squared, that's where I get x. So really square rooting both sides. Okay, so then I end up with positive five and negative five. And usually you're gonna have to write it like this in my math lab with a comma in between. So you can't always use the plus minus sign. You need to understand that's two solutions, positive and negative. Some of them might take the plus or minus. Mm. Okay, problem two is similar. It has the X squared, so I'm gonna add, or excuse me, subtract the two to both sides. So I'm gonna have two X squared equals 10. Then I'm going to divide by two, divide by two, and I'm gonna have X squared equals five. Oh, that's not very pretty. So when I square root it, again, I'm gonna add the positive and negative. It's the square root of five, which isn't pretty like 25. And I cannot reduce it at all. So I'm just going to leave it. Square root of five. Done. So how would I write that with the comma in between? You could write it as the square root of five comma negative square root of five. So that would be what X equals. It's just a decimal. We usually leave it in radical form. If the directions say 
um, round of this, then you could, you know, put the square root in your calculator and get what it rounds to. Okay, so for problem three, I like showing this one. It's kind of that complete the square idea that we're definitely not going to look at. <laughs> um, I mean, if we needed to write something in vertex form, we would, but for our purposes, we we don't, we can use technology. We don't really have to rewrite those functions very much. But if it happens to look like this, what I wanna do is square root right now, right? So square root, square root, already that undoes the square but it leaves an x plus five because that was the whole thing was squared and then a positive negative square root of 49 okay and even if that was 41 whatever it is this is a pretty one um you move this term over and put it in front of the plus and minus no matter what that is over there so this is going to end up being x equals negative five right because i'm going to minus that five over plus or minus, and now it's going to become a seven. If it was ugly, like the square root of five, it would just stay that. But it's negative five plus or minus seven, which we could do. What is negative five plus seven? Well, it happens to be two. What is negative five minus seven more? You have to add them, make it negative. So it's going to be negative seven. I can't add sevens quick. <laughs> negative 12. Okay. So those are our two solutions there. Then four and five. So we could either use the quadratic formula or factor. Now, factoring doesn't always work. Let's write the quad. I should have added that at the top. Quadratic formula. Um, negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC over 2A. Just in case you need that. Um, there's your quadratic formula. So you can, the, the two that I put on here are factorable. So you can just factor them. Um, okay. So for this one, I can just factor it. I don't need anything fancy. Maybe I'll do one with the quadratic formula too. So this one, I can see, well, what multiplies to 18, right? that would make a negative nine. Well, it's a positive 18, so we have to think that's a positive. And I think, well, nine times two, six times three, um, one times 18, those are the only ones I can think of. Which ones add or subtract to nine would have to be six and three, they add to nine, but I need that nine to be negative. So if they're both negative, negative six, negative three, they're gonna multiply to the positive 18, but they'll add to the negative nine. So this will factor into X minus six, X minus three. If you're good at factoring, the, then you can easily factor and then your two solutions are the zeros. It's the idea of zero times zero has to be, zero times anything has to be zero. So the two answers are gonna be six and three. Those are the numbers if I put them in would make a zero in my parentheses. Okay, remember if you have an X out front, that that brings on a zero. So if I was to have like X and then like X minus four, something like this, then the two solutions would be zero and four. So if you have an X out front, not a number, an X out front, okay? So I guess this would be problem 5B. <laughs> All right, so for five, everything needs to go on the same side. So I'm going to, I like to keep the X squared positive because it'd be easier to move the X squared over, but I'm going to move the 30 and the 43 because I need it to be positive. Why do I need it to be positive? Because none of the rules that you learned about factoring work with a negative um, A term or first term, okay, in front of the X squared. So this would become a minus 43 X and a minus 30 equals zero. So we're here. Um, eight does not divide out of each of those. Gosh, so this one, I'm pretty sure this is factorable. 240 divided by... Mm, okay, so I'm going to do this by factoring with what we call the AC method. Sometimes it's called something else. I don't know. 
basically I take eight times three or 30, excuse me, it's a negative 30. And that's gonna give me 240. So eight times 30 is 240. And it's a negative 240. What two factors of negative 240 would make negative 43? Brr. Okay, so I tried 12. So I have 20 times 12. No, 24 um, times 10. That makes 34 if we add them. Nope. So 240 divided by 40. Does 40 go into it? 40 and 6. Oh, my gosh. This has so many factors that that is why we have the quadratic formula up here. Seriously, this is why this exists. Um, What is the right 240? Sorry, I'm trying to think of, oh, I found it. Okay, I'm sitting here plugging in numbers. I found it, five times 48. So five times 48 is 240. And if this one is negative and we add them together, that would make negative 43. Oh, that's not pretty. So what the AC method is, is it's a little bit different method where you break up the middle term. So it would become, positive 5x minus 48x minus 30 equals zero. You use this idea right here to break up the middle term. Then you can use factor by grouping. It will always work this way. So some people learn how to factor even problem four this way, but other teachers just kind of teach guessing. So eight and five, the only thing that comes out of this first term is x, so that becomes 8x plus 5. Now I need the second one to be 8x plus 5. So I'm going to take out a negative to make them both positive. And then what goes into 48 um, and 30 would be 6. So that's going to become 8x plus 5 also. So the two factors are going to be um, x minus 6, what you took out becomes a factor and 8x plus 5. It's kind of like taking the 8x plus 5 out and then what's left makes its own parenthesis. Whoo, that was a lot to factor that. Give me just a sec. I am going to take this little example like you did and move it away so I have more room. Okay, then from here, where does each of these equal 0? So it equals 0 at 6, but then this one I kind of have to show you a little. So I have to minus the 5 over and divide by the 8. So I minus the 5 over divide by the 8. So this one's a fraction. So those are our two solutions. Oh, ugly. So something like that, um, factoring and quadratic formula, really, I don't care which one you use. If you're not good at factoring, use the formula. Okay. All right. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that because I'm pretty sure half of algebra was those problems. Um, so we're going to move on to kind of more of what's going to apply a little more to our business world. And that's going to be what's the domain vertex. I really never care about the axis of symmetry, but we'll do it anyway. And the X in the Y intercepts, max, min, those uh, graph the function range, all this. So we're going to do all of that for problem six. So first thing is what numbers for the domain, right? For A is the domain. For the domain, what numbers can you put in here? Are you restricted by what you can put into X? Well, do you have a fraction with something on the bottom like X plus two or an X? No. Do you have a square root where you can't have a negative? No. So the domain is all reals. You can state all real numbers. You can do negative infinity to infinity, which is um, probably what your book uses the most. It is um, interval notation. Think about it. 
vertex. Well, we can see the vertex number opposite of what's in the parentheses. So that's going to be a negative one and the same outside the negative three, right? This number and this number. But you do the opposite of the first one. Vertex. Axis of symmetry goes right down the middle. So it's going to be a vertical line at that negative one. What cuts it in half? What makes it perfectly symmetrical? Symmetry. It's going to be x equals negative one. Where is the x-intercept? So where does this thing, where are the zeros, right? So for x-intercept, you let y be zero. So let y equal zero. So for our sake, it's exactly what we just did, were learning. Like this, right? So I'm just going to solve this with square root rule, add the three over. Take the square root at this point, right? And when I take the square root over here, I have to add the positive and negative in front. And then it basically just takes away my square. And now I, when I minus the one over, I have to write it in front of the square root. Typically, it will take that as your answer. It might want the decimal. If it wants the decimal, you get out your calculator. What is negative one plus the square root of three is like 0.73. So just put it in your calculator. Then you do negative one minus the square root of three. Okay. So those are our two y, or excuse me, x-intercepts. And then our y-intercept is where x equals zero, a, b, d, c, d, e. So um, you're going to let x equal zero. So basically y equals zero plus one squared minus three. Well, zero plus one is one. One squared is one. One minus three is negative two. Sweet. So this, you could write it as the point zero, negative two. And this one, we could write these as a point two. I didn't do them both though. Um, this, it'd be X is, this is like 0.73-ish um, and zero. And then what was negative? Three is um, negative one. Okay. Those are our intercepts. They give us points, right? Cross the X, cross the Y. And da, 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 a max or a min? Well, look at the front. I don't have that A value out front. So um, it's positive. So it has to go um, upward. And that means it's going to have a minimum. And the minimum is at the vertex. So this is a minimum. And this is also basically the answer to F. Okay, that vertex minimum. Now we get to graph the function, state the range, all of this. Where is it increasing and decreasing? So this is where I we're not in a strict algebra class. We are going to use technology. Could I easily graph it without? Yes. I could put the point negative one, negative three, and then follow the pattern which with the A value, which is just a one, and go up one over one, up one over one, both directions, and we're done. But what I'm going to do, um, split view, is show it on Desmos. I use Desmos because it's super easy for me to show you. You're welcome to use Desmos. I program Desmos into your exams. So absolutely acceptable if you don't want to buy a graphing calculator. If you have a graphing calculator, great. Then you're um, set to go. So um, this was x plus 1. And then we square it minus 3. So then I'm going to move that over just so we can see it. Here's our vertex, which we wrote down. Here's our um, intercepts that we wrote down, so we could double check those. Look, and then the y-intercepts at the negative two, those are all the points we just got. Mathematically, we can see them, right? I can see it's a minimum right here. I can see the axis of symmetry goes right down that middle. Um, and then it wants us to graph the function, state the range. Remember, the range has to do with the y values. So notice at the curve that all of our points on our graph are above. So for 
G, let's, we'll look at G in just a sec. That's going to be our graph, right? Well, I guess I can probably graph it okay here. It's going to be something here, something here, something here, here, something like this. And you could label on your graph, however, um, in, in my math lab, you'll have to, you know, put your vertex and then you always start with your vertex. That's what you graph first. And then you could pick one other point and it will automatically make the rest of your points work. Okay. Um, so H is state that range. Range is wise, right? What could you get out? The only values I'm going to get out if I put in, I wish I could point to it, but if I put in any X on the graph, I can't point to it here. If I put in any X in the graph, the only values I'm going to get out would be on this graph. So they're all above this point right here. So we would say um, you Y's are greater than or equal to the negative three. Because that's down at negative three for that vertex. So that's your range. You really have to look at the graph for a range, either above or below something. And then um, state the interval in which it's decreasing. Okay, decreasing is falling to the right. So that's going to be this section. You're going down to the right. That sections are increasing. So we're decreasing. Let's see how many. We're decreasing from negative infinity to um, our x value, which was negative 1. Um, and then we're, for j, we're going to go from that negative 1 to infinity, and that's where we're increasing. Make sure it's in the right order. Increasing decreasing okay they're just falling to the right you're going down falling going up to the right increasing decreasing all right let me unsplit screen right and so i put a couple extra on here i'm not going to do an extra right now um i would like you know if a class if we were in class i would be like try the next one <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just have an extra one there just in case. Especially if I look around and y'all are falling asleep on me. Oh, now I'm going to choke on nothing. All right. <clears throat> so for problem eight. So for problem eight, it's not necessarily in vertex form because it doesn't have the parentheses. But it is in vertex form because there's no X term. So it's kind of like that tricky one. It's in standard form, kind of like eight and nine. Um, but it's a little harder for some people to recognize that that's in both forms at the same time. So really, <clears throat> in order to find everything we've been doing, I want to start with the vertex. And the domain, oh, I forgot what the list of things are. Do I have one with, I don't have one right here. Uh, domain, vertex, axis, symmetry. Okay, sorry, I just forgot what we were, which, which order they were in. So domain is always all reals. X squared, all reals. There's no zero on the denominator. There's no square root with a negative. Um, those are the only things that affect your domain. Um, a log where you can't do a negative log. So we're done. Uh, B said, domain it was vertex okay so what this is the first time we're going to use this negative b over 2a and that's what the x equals on the vertex and we're going to use that if we look this is our a term right so a is going to equal negative one b is a zero because it's the number in front of x and there's not one and c is nine so we're going to use those a b c those numbers in front Maybe it would help if you wrote this as negative x squared plus zero x plus nine up to you. So we can put those values in and I see a negative zero over two times negative one, zero. First of all, it can't really be negative, but whatever. Negative zero is still zero. Zero divided by anything is still nothing. So our x term is zero. All right. 
then our y term would be to put that zero into the function right here, okay? Zero squared is zero, zero times negative one is zero, zero plus nine is nine. So our vertex is the point zero, nine. Now, if you're good and you were really good at algebra, you could probably see that this is the same as if I wrote this, um, oh gosh, this is the third way I'm gonna write it, but that's fine. Um, negative x plus zero squared plus nine. That's the same thing as well. So I can see that the vertex is zero, nine. Some people can get it straight away. Some people might need the formula. Okay, so once I found the vertex, give me just a sec. I am going to pull this up over here. My only reason is because I want to see the A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> Um, just so I'm following how it does your homework. So, um, hurry up. So what we want to do next, I think, is the intercepts on this. So remember, to find the x-intercept, I'm going to let y equal zero. To find the y-intercept, I let x equal zero. So, perfect. Yeah, we have Um, just kidding. I opened the wrong 2.1. All right, here we go. So A, B, C, yeah, oh, C is the axis of symmetry. All right, axis of symmetry is going to be at zero because that's where our vertex is, right? That'll cut it in half. A, B, C, D, D is going to be our x-intercept. So x-intercept is where y equals zero. So it's zero equals negative x squared plus nine. I can just solve this by um, square roots. I'm going to minus the nine over, divide by negative one. Square root is positive and negative three. Okay, so our intercepts would be at three zero and negative three zero. Those are pretty. Um, I'm running out of room because I keep writing A B C D E. I keep writing too big. E is the y-intercept. That's where you put in zero for x. So really, the your y is going to equal negative zero squared plus nine. So that's nine. And so the, the y-intercept is at zero, nine, which is also our vertex. That's where it crosses the y. All right, then we can look at the graph again. We'll just use our technology. Um, Plug that one in. This one is negative x squared plus nine. Perfect. Put that off. All right. So here's our vertex at that zero nine. It's also the place where it crosses the y. These better be at three. They are and negative three. There's our graph. So I'm just going to walk through this. We're going to say it out loud. I'm not going to write it because I'm out of room. But this has a maximum at zero nine. It's a max because it curves upward, right? So that's our max up top. And then we would say, I'll sketch <coughs> nine, I'll sketch the graph. So I could point to it. So this is our max at, at that point um, zero nine. And then this is rising to the right. So that's our increasing. This is decreasing, okay? Increasing, decreasing, range. Range would be y is less than nine. This, that's the top, is at nine. Anything below nine, you could get a value, okay? That's a range. All right, so enough of those type of ones. So let's see, nine similar. Then let's look at applying some of these. And I'm also going to show you, we really do focus on Excel more in this class than we do like a graphing calculator. So I am going to show you how to do this. Um, you learned it last week, again, um, in both settings, but I'm going to show it on Excel. So here we are. Find the revenue cost for this function, yada, yada, yada. Um, so here's our revenue, here's our cost, the always means cost, R is revenue, P is profit, 
Okay, X refers to the number of items. So X is your items sold. Almost solely, why do we always set them up the same? So that you can understand when someone gives you a function, what each value means in terms of your business. Okay, how many components must be sold in order for them to break even? Break even is where they cross. Where are they the same? So you can use graphing or by hand. It doesn't really matter. But really, it's where does x, 200 minus 4x, where does that equal 160 plus 20x? Where are they equal to each other? That's our break-even point, okay? So this would be 200x minus 4x squared equals 160 plus 20x. So I'm going to move everything where the x squared is positive. So I'm going to move them all to the right. So this is a negative 200x. It has to minus to the x term, right? And then we'll add the other one over. So um, we're going to add the 4x squared, just add the 4x squared. So that's going to have 0 equals, but I'm going to write the 4x squared first. And then this term here is going to be what? Negative 180x plus the 160. Um, we can easily take a 4 out, so this one's a little bit easier to um, uh, factor. So we're going to take the 4 out, and I'm going to have x squared um, minus 45x. What's 160 plus 40? Okay, so then um, the factors of 40, ooh, 4 and 10 don't make 45. 8 and 5, ooh, I don't know if that's factorable. These answers, oh, well, let's just use the quadratic. These answers might actually be decimals. I'm too lazy to do the quadratic. Let's just look at it on the graph. Okay, so in your graphing calculator, you would put them in y equals two spots and you'd use the intersection button, right? Um, or in Desmos, I can kind of do it different. I can do like this, minus 4x parenthesis equals 160 plus 20x, and it will just tell me the answer right here. I can just set them equal to each other like that. Or what I could do also, it's, so what's our answer? Let's get that. 0 0.907. 0 0.907 equals X. Okay, I don't have the Y answer, but that's what X equals. So let me, oops. We could do it this way too. I don't want to confuse you. Okay, there's our one function equals We'll just have to call it y because you have to have x and y. And then y equals 160 plus 20x. Okay, so then what we could do is here's our two functions. One's a parabola, one's not. And then we have to go up here and find the point. So what's cool about graphing them both is I do see the y value. <laughs> what did it say? 178. 0.144. So downfalls of Desmos, it only goes out three decimals. Sometimes your homework says four. Um, things like that. If you get something wrong little like that, please just send it to me. All right. So we got the break-even point. Now it says find the profit. So let's just go back to our full screen here. What is profit? Well, I gave a hint on the snow packet. Profit, right? If revenue is our money coming in, cost is how much money we are putting out. Isn't our profit them subtracted? Yes. Oh, and we hope it's not negative. Our revenue better be higher than our cost. So you have to do revenue minus cost to see what you're really making. Don't flip them around. So in terms of functions, our revenue, um, so profit is going to be our revenue, which was, um, x times 200 minus 4x. That's just in terms of the function there. This entire function minus 
the entire function of 1. That doesn't look like a 1. 60 plus 20x. Like that. Okay, so that's it. You don't have to do anything else. You, you don't have to simplify it. It doesn't really matter. Determine the maximum profit. All right, so we have to have a max. So you could simplify that, sure. Or you could just graph it. Um, I could graph it with exactly what I see, which is 200 minus 4x. Parenthesis, parenthesis, minus, parenthesis. I have to have the parenthesis because I'm subtracting the entire function from the other function. Otherwise, um, you won't quite get the right answer. So here's that function. And, oh, I don't, I'm not very good at um, changing the scale on this. I just going to try to find the top there. Woo, way up there. All right. So our maximum profit, so it better be a high point, is going to be um, x is going to equal 22.5, y is going to equal 1865. What does x always stand for in every single business problem? The number of items sold. So I sold 22.5 items and my profit is $1,865. Okay. All right, so starting to kind of get into those problems um, that actually use quadratics that have to do with business. Okay, I have a couple more in there. I'm going to bounce to the bottom. Um, those other two are very similar. Um, they may not ask break even, but it's still going to be where's putting in numbers sometimes and then minimum or maximum. Minimum cost is a common one where it'll go this way for your x squared and the minimum cost would be that lowest point. Okay, so what if I want to um, do a model for a quadratic? Okay, so we've already done this for linear. What if we want it to be um, a line of best fit that's not it's not a line. I called it the line of best fit, a regression, not line. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my iPad and I'm going to show this in Excel. Stop share. Oops. I don't want to stop my recording. I just want to stop share. Mm. There we go. <laughs> I was like, uh, it's trying to make me stop the recording. I don't want to. All right. So let me go ahead and share my screen real quick and open Excel. Uh -huh, ba -ba -ba. Where's that? Let's just share my screen. Why does it keep doing that? I don't really know. So they had some changes on me. All right, so here's some data. Oh, there's a random word right here in my Excel, right? So here's some data. It's in the middle of my Excel here. Um, I don't like it. This is the way that it did it in the problem. You really are going to have to go X. Maybe I'll label that for us. X, Y, like this, and you're going to have to go down. So when you type it into Excel, it needs to go downward or it's not going to quite do it right. So I only have three points, a couple of your homework are this easy, but I'm going to take this and I need to see what kind of pattern it is. So I'm going to go to that insert again and insert that scatter plot. And that is going to kind of show me that pattern. There's only three dots, so I can't really see it real well. Definitely a curve, definitely not a line. Then again, I would go to this plus. I'm going to add the trend line, but I have to hit this little arrow to get to more options. I don't want a linear, I want a polynomial order two. Why does it not say quadratic? Because a polynomial to the order of two is a quadratic, right? We use quadratic so much, it has its own name. But, um, you know, then we start to say third degree, fourth degree, polynomial. And we leave that word off a lot. So. 
a third degree, like x to the third is a polynomial with a third degree, those kind of things. So we're going to click that. And then what we're going to do is display the equation on our chart. And there's our equation of our align using Excel. Okay. Um, and then that's what you would have for your solution. In this note packet, the next section, I have two that you have to find the equation of the line. Um, I think they're both lines. But you would graph them and see if they're curved, perfect curve, um, quadratic. Also, in your homework, you might be asked in that trend line, you might be asked to do a log or a different um, level of a polynomial. Okay. So if you're doing, if you have something that starts like this and kind of goes, you might be asked to find the log. I'll, I'll click it and just show you kind of what. Um, can't be calculated. Oh, you can't even do a log. Hello, it has negatives. <laughs> um, anyway, you can easily find the equation and the, in the homework is very specific for you. It says use a log or, or use whatever to find that equation of the line, um, or that function. It's not really a line. I like to show this in Excel because that we have an Excel component for your class, but you can also do it on your graphing calculators. That's totally fine. You can learn how to do it in Desmos. It takes using the squiggly and the tables, um, not intuitive on Desmos. So you'll have to probably Google how to do a regression in um, Desmos if you want to use that. All right, that's all I really have for this section. It really is a section of reminding you how to do quadratics and then kind of trying to apply it to that um, profit revenue cost, okay?